We have already examined the inexplicable and haunting occurrences at Utah's infamous Skinwalker Ranch in previous episodes, but across the border, in neighbouring Arizona, lies another remote farmstead with an equally terrifying history. This week, we investigate one man's horrifying conflict with extraterrestrial intruders, as we pay a visit to Stardust Ranch. It had not been until early evening that John Edmonds had finally decided he'd had enough of hauling furniture and unpacking boxes, and was ready to call it a day. Stopping off at the kitchen in order to grab himself a hard-earned beer, he made his way out onto the porch and sat quietly surveying his new home. The ranch that he and his wife Joyce had just purchased covered ten acres of land, and in addition to the five-bedroom building itself, it came with a pool a guest house, and two horse corrals. From an early age, John had dreamed of owning a place where he could spend his days tending to injured and unwanted horses, and he had finally made this a reality. Sipping his beer, Edmonds noticed some movement in the undergrowth that lined the property's far perimeter. After a few moments, a solitary figure emerged from the tree line, striding with purpose across the open fields towards the house. John had not been expecting anyone, and when the fading sunlight suddenly glinted off something long and metallic held in the approaching figure's hand, he instinctively stepped back inside to grab his revolver. Re-emerging from the farmhouse, Edmonds began to walk towards the intruder, openly displaying the firearm in a show of warning. As the distance between them closed, he found himself thinking that this must be something to do with the debacle surrounding the belongings of the previous owners. Several days prior, when he and Joyce had arrived at the ranch, they had found to their dismay that the premises were still filled with furniture and personal possessions. A phone call was made to the agents, who apologised profusely and asked them to come back the following day once they had spoken to the previous tenants. The next morning, John had returned to find the house empty, but every fixture and fitting was now mysteriously broken up and deposited outside in the empty swimming pool. Another call was made to the agents, who denied all knowledge of this, stating they had still not heard back from the previous owners. After another day of waiting, Edmonds had finally lost his patience with the situation, and arranged to have the unwanted mess disposed of himself. As the two men pulled up a few feet short of one another, an uneasy silence descended on the scene, the stranger was dressed in the well-worn fatigues of an army veteran, with unkempt hair and a distinctly haunted expression, but it was the rusted machete he was brandishing that held John's attention, and caused him to keep his hand firmly on his gun. When the man spoke, his words were hushed, and he claimed to have worked for the previous owners. Edmonds calmly explained that the property had now changed hands, and asked the former employee why he was carrying the blade. The stranger replied that it was for hunting monsters, which is what he had been paid to do. John thought for a moment, then calmly told the man that his help was no longer required, as he had not seen any monsters recently. There was another brief pause before a mocking peal of laughter burst from the rancher's lips. The man petulantly threw the machete to the ground and began to walk away, before turning and shouting that John would be sorry. As he watched the retreating figure disappear back into the trees, the new owner of Stardust Ranch had no idea just how true this statement would be. Initially, the idyllic rural existence they had chosen worked well for John and Joyce. Over the first few weeks, they started to receive a steady supply of sick and neglected horses. 
Being only an hour and a half's drive from Phoenix meant that everything they needed was within easy reach. The first sign that the agents might not have been entirely honest about how they had marketed the property came when John tried to get the ranch's faulty phone line repaired. Despite having arranged three different appointments, nobody from the phone company had ever materialised to fix the problem. It was not until he registered a formal complaint that an engineer had reluctantly made a brief appearance. When he did eventually arrive, the repairman worked as fast as he could to rectify the problem, to the point where John demanded to know why he was so eager to leave. Without pausing to stop what he was doing, the worker hurriedly explained that the ranch was cursed, and that everybody in the local community went out of their way to avoid it. Several days after this unsettling conversation, it became clear to John that not everybody was choosing to avoid his property. On his morning rounds, he noticed that somebody had been tampering with the fencing that surrounded the two horse corrals. At several points, the metal fence posts had been wrenched out of the ground, and in some cases, they had been bent and twisted out of shape. The incidents continued, with the damage becoming progressively worse. John would hear strange humming noises at night, but when he went outside to look, he could not find their source. Only with the arrival of daylight the following morning would the full extent of the damage be discovered. Things eventually came to a climax when he found one of the horses dead. The unfortunate animal had been choked to death by a heavy iron post, which had somehow been warped and twisted around its neck. It was only as John puzzled over what could have bent the thick metal bar in such a way that Joyce broke down and told him that she felt like there were people in the farmhouse watching her. She said that she had caught sight of shadowy figures following her from room to room, silhouettes that only appeared at the periphery of her vision and seemed to dissolve or vanish when she tried to focus on them. Edmonds tried to reassure her that she was just tired and on edge because of the vandalism, but the senseless death of the horse concerned him. He decided to start placing weapons within easy reach at strategic points around the house. A deceptive period of calm then followed, but it was not long before the situation took a terrifying turn for the worse. One evening, John was awake in bed, unable to settle due to Joyce's periodic snoring. Whilst he lay staring at the room's far wall, the shadows there suddenly seemed to swell and contort before a trio of dark figures materialised. Frozen in terror, he watched helplessly as the shadowy intruders slowly made their way over to his wife's side of the bed. As the lead figure reached out towards her, John felt his fear suddenly turn to rage. With a roar of anger, he leapt to his feet, reaching down for the aluminium baseball bat beside the bed. In seconds, he was across the room, lashing out at the dark shapes that were now leaning over his sleeping wife. With a wild swing, he felt the metal bat connect with the nearest one. There was a high-pitched shriek before the figures immediately vanished, leaving a bewildered Joyce asking John why he was stood looming over her with a baseball bat. The police were called, but they could find no evidence to back up John's claim. They seemed more concerned with the array of weapons that had been stashed in each room, and their departure only seemed to embolden whoever or whatever had invaded their home. On a weekly basis from this point onwards, John Edmonds would find himself fighting for both his and his wife's very survival. During the evenings whilst he struggled to stay awake watching over Joyce, Edmonds began to hear deep humming sounds off in the distance. Occasionally, when he looked out of his window, he would observe what appeared to be gaping portals of some kind, inexplicably appearing in the middle of the night sky, illuminating the surrounding darkness. John witnessed mysterious craft and bright orbs of light disappearing into the portals, which would then close behind them, leaving no trace of their existence. Sometimes, these objects would be shadowed or pursued by what looked like military aircraft, fueling his suspicions that the government were fully aware of what was happening on the ranch. The nighttime incursions by the occupants of these craft continued. John observed that they always moved around in groups of three, seemingly possessing the ability to pass through locked windows and doors. He described them as being approximately four feet tall, 
with skin that was deathly cold to the touch. On the occasions where he was able to get close enough to strike out at them with a knife or other bladed instrument, Edmund stated that the fluid which issued forth from their wounds had a similar consistency to brake fluid. One evening, Edmund saw the family Rottweiler pursuing a group of these creatures across the ground outside the house. It was able to catch and bite one of them, which subsequently disappeared into thin air. Tragically, the dog immediately began to choke, dying a short time afterwards. The rancher would lose a further two dogs in identical circumstances, but these were not the only animals that would suffer. Some of the horses would also be found mutilated. At other times, he would see the hulking shadows of what he called Barillo men, stalking the extremities of his property. He stated that these creatures resembled Sasquatches. Despite his best efforts, Edmonds could not possibly remain awake all the time, and he would often collapse out of sheer exhaustion. One evening, he had involuntarily dozed off, but was suddenly jolted awake with a feeling of pure dread. What he witnessed chilled him to his very core. Joyce was fast asleep in front of him, but was being lifted off the bed by a thin beam of bright light, being projected into the room from outside. As Joyce's sleeping form was propelled across the room towards the now open window, he knew he had to act fast. Up until this point, he had tried to avoid using his rifle if possible, due to the fact his house was a brick building and for fear of his neighbours reporting him to the police but now, he had no choice. In a heartbeat, John was outside, his assault rifle in hand. Without even looking to see what was emitting the beam of light, he aimed in the direction and fired off an entire magazine of ammunition, the weapon kicking wildly against his shoulder. He heard the rounds impacting off something metallic a short distance away, but the light beam continued to shine. Within moments, he'd reloaded, and again fired blindly at the light source, until it blinked out of existence. In the sudden silence, he saw an undefined dark shape moving away from the house at great speed, before it disappeared into a portal. Returning to the bedroom, he found his wife collapsed in a corner. By now, John was beside himself, and resorted to handcuffing Joyce to the bed, in order to prevent her from being taken. Despite his best efforts, both he and his wife began to experience periods of missing time. Sometimes, when they awoke, they would find strange and inexplicable injuries on their bodies. The most worrying of these resembled deep cuts or lacerations, which had healed as if some lengthy period of time had passed since they were inflicted. Finally, an exasperated Edmonds contacted the local media, pleading for assistance from anybody who could help rid him of the attackers. He participated in radio and television interviews, allowing ufologists and research teams to visit the ranch. However, the problems persisted. Eventually, after 20 years desperately trying to follow his dream, John was forced to give in. In 2016, he and Joy sold Stardust Ranch and moved away, never to return. At first glance, the story of John and Joyce Edmonds is as easy to dismiss as many other tales of its kind. A scenario where supposed intelligent alien life has elected to harass and torment an unremarkable couple over a 20 year time frame seems an unlikely one. The apparent inability to capture their assailants on film at any point during those two decades also seems somewhat unconvincing. John Edmonds himself said that he had killed 18 of the creatures that invaded his home but never presented any of the bodies. He did explain that they disappeared immediately after death, which many skeptics believe is highly convenient. Many commentators who have examined the incident are also quick to point out that prior to going public with his story, John Edmonds had been looking to sell the ranch for one million US dollars. In the aftermath of the resultant media circus, the property would end up being sold for more than five times that price. So rather than a terrifying and shocking case of alien harassment, could this in fact be one of the most successful marketing ploys in the history of real estate? Ultimately, that could be the case, but there remains a significant number of incidents that add weight to the story, 
and this is in no small part due to the fact that John and Joyce are not the only people to report strange activity on the property, with the number of alleged witnesses being much higher. Gina Irons and her family lived at the ranch during the 1970s, and since John Edmonds went public, she also came forward to speak to the media about her past experiences. She describes ghostly figures that would unexpectedly invade the home, with her and her younger brother feeling temperatures plunge dramatically whenever the entities passed from room to room. In 2015, the Ghost Adventures team spent several days at the ranch whilst filming an episode of their show. During the visit, a number of mysterious lights and strange figures were observed moving around the property, with one of the team members sustaining unexplained bruises to one of her arms. They left the ranch believing that the intruders were not extraterrestrial in nature, but were instead demonic entities masquerading as aliens. They arrived at this conclusion because the creatures seemed to retreat whenever prayers or biblical texts were recited by the victims. They also went on to state that there was a spirit of a man haunting the property, who shot himself in the living room. On another occasion, a different research team reported having disturbed a thin humanoid figure that ran off and disappeared into the undergrowth. When the investigators searched the area, they discovered a circular stone, into which a mysterious star shape had somehow been carved. The most intriguing and well-publicised evidence to come out of Stardust Ranch occurred during a live web chat between John and the Camelot Project's Kerry Cassidy in 2016. It was only when Cassidy was reviewing the footage of the interview that she noticed what appeared to be a short grey figure momentarily peeking out from behind a wall. This went unnoticed by Edmonds, who had been sitting with his back towards it. In 2013, a mutual friend put John in contact with a biologist by the name of William Levengood. After some initial consultation between the two men, Edmonds was able to send Levengood samples of tissue and fluid that had been left behind after he had struck one of the intruders with a short sword. A few days later, Levengood contacted him in an excited state. The DNA he'd extracted from the tissue was unlike anything else on Earth. Alongside this, the fluid that John had provided was completely saturated with a substance resembling chlorophyll, and was very similar to samples that had been collected at the scene of cattle mutilations all around the globe. Levengood asked John if he was prepared to go public with the findings, and then disclosed that he himself intended to reach out to the rest of the scientific community. After this call, things went unexpectedly quiet, and it would not be until several weeks later, when he tried to regain contact with Levengood, that Edmonds was informed the scientist had died. With growing apprehension, John inquired what had happened to his samples, only to be informed that there had been a fire at the laboratory a few days after Levengood's death, and that nothing had been salvaged. He would later discover that Levengood's wife had also died, not long after her husband. This is perhaps not as strange as it sounds, as both the biologist and his wife were in their 80s. Nevertheless, Levengood's death would further raise John's suspicions about the government somehow being involved, but it was an unexpected visit not long after he had contacted the media, which finally convinced him that the authorities were working against him. About two weeks after he had spoken to the press, John was working in one of the corrals, when he saw two men dressed in black suits standing outside the main gates. As he watched in disbelief, the two figures seemed to walk straight through the metal bars, before approaching him and ordering him to keep quiet about the activity on his property. The two men, who wore dark hats and sunglasses and emitted a foul odour, then walked away before disappearing completely. Whether or not you believe John Edmonds, there does appear to be a degree of honesty in his retelling of events. He has been accused of exaggerating his accounts, but has remained steadfast in his conviction. People who have interviewed him in relation to his claims state that he is a sober and convincing witness. His stories, whilst fantastic in nature, are always told in a grounded and logical manner, with the traumatic effects they have left upon his soul clear in the way that he relates them. It's possible that he may have exaggerated his accounts, but we can't help but feel there is perhaps more to this story. 
Whilst others have advocated the fact that he has profited from this misery as a reason to doubt him, why not turn a bad situation to one's advantage if the opportunity so arises? It doesn't do his integrity any favours, but it doesn't mean that there is no truth to his story either. It's interesting to note just how much the ranch would eventually sell for, more than five times the asking price, which is unheard of for properties in that area. Assuming the buyer purchased the property because of its supernatural activity, this seems like a huge investment to make based on witness testimony alone. One has to wonder whether the new owner has witnessed the activity for themselves. In any case, the descriptions of events bear a striking similarity to the incidents which took place at the more famous Skinwalker Ranch. Alongside this, Arizona itself remains a hotbed for some of the most infamous UFO incidents reported on American soil. Stardust Ranch lies only a stone's throw from where people have historically gathered to observe the famed Phoenix Lights. It is also close to the town of Snowflake, where Travis Walton was allegedly abducted back in 1975. In future episodes, we intend to return to the Copper State to cover these and other associated stories. Whatever the case may be, there does appear to be a degree of correlation between this story and those of other reported incidents, although we concede that it is difficult to believe due to the lack of any supporting evidence. If there is any truth to the tale surrounding Stardust Ranch, we can only hope that John and Joyce have finally found the peace which they so desperately fought for. <laughs>